So we're in Romans chapter 6 uh, for consideration uh, today. Romans chapter 6 and verses 15 to 23. Romans chapter 6 and verses 15 to 23. Um, I have to admit, I'm not a a political person. I don't know much about politics. I give off about it now and again, but it's usually from a position of ignorance. Uh, Or or at least very, very shallow understanding. But one thing I, I have learned as I've watched politicians and I've watched interviews and various things, questions sometimes more than we think they mean. Sometimes the questions asked by the interviewer of politicians is, is trying to say something other than what it sounds like. It's trying to ask a question other than what's being asked. And even more so, the answers that are given are often far less than what they were ever meant to be. They were never going to answer the question. And it seems like that here in this passage, as we come to the second question in Romans chapter 6, the Paul's interlocutor, this, this questioner who's coming through in Paul's thinking as he's trying to work out what's, what he needs to say about all that he's teaching, has come with another question. A question about sin. And he's already asked that question. Last week we thought about the first question in the first verse. And that was about, can we sin? What then? Can we sin if it brings about the grace of God? If God is glorified by our sin, why don't we just go ahead and sin? And Paul brings his, all, all the force of his argument and he says, by no means. You can't sin thinking or arguing that your sin is going to make things better because it won't. And the two pieces of the argument that he gives is that you've been born again to something different. You've been born again to holiness, and you've been called to walk in newness of life. Therefore, sin cannot possibly bring the blessing of God in the way that you think. You cannot hope that by sinning more and more, you will see the grace of God more and more. That's a false way of thinking, and it's why it is a, it is a, it is a false doctrine uh, throughout the history of the church. But now, even as he has answered that question, he said these words in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not of law, or not under law, but under grace. And not little phrase, since you are not under law, but under grace, he realizes, brings another question to the fore. And in, cha- in verse 15 of chapter 6, the very next verse, he imagines the interlocutor, the other person, the other side of the conversation, the, the Jewish person who loves the law, who has followed the law, who has been taught the law all of their life, asking the question, what then are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? And so what we see here is another question, not can we sin so that it brings glory to God, or so that we see the grace of God. But can we sin just because we can? Because the law is not counted against us. Because the law of Moses doesn't stand against us to stop us. Can we just sin because we can sin? And we can understand the argument because the Apostle Paul has been revealing to us throughout the epistle to the Romans, and he will continue to do so on into the next chapter as well, to see the limitations of the law of Moses, to see the limitations of the old covenant. We have already heard earlier on that the that the law, uh, the, that the law of God, or the law of the Old Testament can, can expose sin, it can make sin more readily uh, uh, visible to our eyes. It makes it more uh, more plain to us so that we can't ignore it. But it fails in that it cannot actually be dealt with by itself. It cannot deal with sin. It cannot deal with the problem. The law has an issue in that it can only lead us so far. And he has been telling his readers that it's the Christ who has fulfilled the demands of the law. It's Christ who is one who's done all that was needed that the law could not do. But in his statement, he realizes the question will come again. And similar to the previous question, he answers with this, by no means, an emphatic no. You cannot sin just because you're not under the law. 
And then he proceeds what at first glance seems to be to answer a different question. He says in verse 16 of Romans chapter 6, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Seems strange. And yet Paul is telling us that the question that was being asked about sinning just because we can is actually asking more than what we thought it was. And the answer needs to answer more if it's to answer the question well. And so what Paul does is he brings the image of slavery to the minds of his readers. And in the first century, this image would be, would be um, appropriate for them. It would be really uh, plain in their view because in the first century, what would happen is if you got yourself into financial difficulty, if your business went down or things went wrong... You could sell yourself into indentured slavery. In order to pay off your debt, you could pre- present yourself to your creditors and uh, work for a period of time until your debt was paid off. In Rome, we know that slavery was even a bigger thing. You could be sold for your sin. so You could be forced into slavery. But the whole point of the image that he's presenting for us is presenting ourselves for slavery, presenting ourselves uh, to, to our creditors and saying, Take me, take my body, take my time, take my effort until my debt is paid off. And the whole point was to stave off starvation. It was to stop you losing everything. It was to stop you falling into crime and all the punishments that would go with it in order to uh, make ends meet. And with this illustration, Paul is showing them that the question about sin is not just about sin. It's about who is in control of our lives. It's about what is in control of our lives. It's about what we live for. It's about who we live for. And he makes it very, very plain to us that when we think about sin, we're not thinking about something that is neutral. We're thinking about a force that is seeking to have control over our lives. We're thinking about a a, a way of thinking and a way of behaving that wants to master us and to make us submit to its will and to make us miserable. When he talks about sin, he's talking about something that wants to control us and to make a mockery of our testimony. So when we think about this as Christians today, and we're thinking about it particularly as Christians today, we're thinking about the effect of sin on our lives and our testimony as we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. What do those sins, what do those choices to do what is against God, what do they really matter? Because in the end, what difference does one little sin make? What does one little failure make? What does one little foolish decision make? That's what we have to think about this morning. Paul, in answering the question, gives us three arguments again that show us that sin is always the wrong choice. To show that whenever temptation comes into our lives, we should say no. And this is in addition to what we heard in the first part of the chapter. We're adding to that. We're, 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 we're building up this portfolio of defenses that we need to remind ourselves in the good days for when temptation comes into our lives. He, these are three arguments to throw us, show us sin is the wrong choice and that it is a foul, foul master. The first is this. Why would you sin? Your heart has been changed. Your heart has been changed. Verses 17 to 18 go like this. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. We notice a similarity in this argument from the previous uh, section because Paul is reminding them once again of a change that has been made in them in the very nature of their being. He's telling them that they have been transformed. That here are people who are just like us. People, ordinary folk who deal with all of the trials and difficulties of life, but probably even in more difficult circumstances. 
But from what he knows of them, and he hasn't met them personally, most of them, what he knows of them, here are people who have been transformed by the gospel. They were once slaves of sin, but what? They have become be obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. They have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. Do you see the transformation that has been made in the people in the Roman church? They have been transformed from what they once were to what they are now, to people who love righteousness, the people who love holiness, the people who love to please God and hate sin. Friends, we can't overestimate the change that has been made because we know the nature of human beings because we are human beings and we know what our nature was before we were saved. Before we were saved, sin was nothing. Sin was just the way, a way of life. We were just doing what we wanted to do. Any talk about sin was just an encroachment on our freedom. But Christ changed us. And he did the same for the people in Rome. He did the same for these people. And what he wants to say to them is that, friends, temptation's coming against you. But it's a temptation to do something that your heart hates. Your redeemed heart hates. Your new God-like nature hates. Friends, do we not understand this argument? We do, don't we? Because we know that when temptation comes into our lives, it is attractive, isn't it? Else it wouldn't be temptation. Temptation that isn't attractive is not a temptation at all. But temptation comes into our lives and it is attractive. But friends, we know how we feel about sin. We know how we feel Whenever sin confronts us, whenever we see it as it really is, whenever we put aside the lies it tells us, now we have to do that because it will smother us with all sorts of lies and all sorts of ideas and all sorts of justifications. But when we see sin for what it is, we know what it is, don't we? We know that the sin is to sully the name of the one that we love and worship. You know, we come here every Lord's Day and we come and we lift our hearts in song to the Lord. We give time to remember him and that he has died for our sins. We, we give attention to his word. We profess in worship together that we are his. Whenever we sin, we choose to blemish his name. We choose to turn our back on who he is. Friends, that's what sin is, isn't it? It's turning your back on what Christ has done. It's to delve into the filthiness and the disgustingness of our lives. Friends, you know, sin presents itself as a clean thing, as a lovely thing, as a healthy thing. But it's not. Sin is filthy. Sin is vile. Sin is disgusting in the eyes of God. And God has given us a heart to see this, to understand it and know it. Friend, sin causes separation from God, doesn't it? We, we read before about verses that tell us that if we sin, that, we, that God will not hear our prayers. If we, if, if we harbor secret sin in our lives, if we love it and nurture it and don't deal with it. But friends, we know the, the real practical implication of this. Because I know for me, when I sin, what is the first thing that's hard to do? It's hard to pray. And it's hard to read. It's hard to give attention to what God's saying, isn't it? That's the very first thing sin does. You feel, you fall down, and you're afraid to even go to Mass for forgiveness because you're so ashamed of what you've done. And this is what sin invites into your life. This is what sin brings. Your heart has been changed so that you love Him, but whenever you are tempted to sin, you're tempted to sully His name. You're tempted into the filthiness of life, things that you wouldn't touch normally. You're, 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 you're suckered into, into separating yourself from God. You have to deal with the shame, don't you? That I've let him down again. That I've turned my back on him again. That I've done what I've done wrong so many times in the past. Friends, our heart knows that sin is not for us. 
it's one of the evidences that we're born again. It's one of the evidences that Christ is, has transformed us and that we know that sin is not for us. And for us to choose to sin is to dishonor the Lord. It's to, in, it, it's to dive into failure and shame and vileness. It's to give Christ the back of our hand like the soldiers at the crucifixion rather than the worship that he is due. Friends, sitting here in this service, we all feel the awfulness of that. But friends, we need to remind ourselves of the awfulness whenever temptation comes. Because that's when it gets us. When now we're not thinking. When we're not contemplating these things. Whenever we're busy with other things, when we're bored, when we're not, in, when, 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 we're, when we're distracted, that's when it comes in. And, sing, and it tells us that that sin is just for us, but it's not. It's a lie. Christ has changed your heart. Second argument he gives is not only that, why would you sin you've already been, or why would you sin your heart's been changed? Why would you sin you've already been there before? Why would you sin you've already been there before? Verses 19 to 20. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free with regards to righteousness. Paul here admits that the slave analogy is a bit limited because he's talking about becoming being a slave of sin and then a slave to righteousness. And it's very hard to get your head around slave to righteousness, especially when slave has such negative connotations in our thinking. But that doesn't mean that we don't take it seriously. We do have to take it seriously and think about what it actually says to us. What he's telling us here is that we have experienced sin before. Friends, there is no sin that comes against you. There is no temptation that comes against you that you have not experienced before, is there? I know for me, the temptation against me is the same old ones. Same old lies. Same old promises. Same old thoughts. Same old destruction. Sin comes and it just gives you the same old rubbish again and again. Dressed up as something new. Dressed up and cleaned up as if it's something to be desired. Sanitized and purified, at least in its externals. And yet we know the lawlessness that sin brings. We know the lawless cycle of sin. We know what it does in the lives of those who indulge in it. We know what it has done in our lives in the past. Paul reminds the people, this is where they came from. They had known sin. They'd been there. They'd been in the temples. They'd been in the places that they shouldn't have been. They'd indulged in the things that they shouldn't have indulged in. They'd been there. They'd been saved out of it. And now temptation was coming, but it was just taking them straight back again. He reminds them that there was a time when they were free in regard to righteousness. They never thought about righteousness. They never thought about a desire for righteousness. They never thought about the hope they could have in righteousness. They were free, but God had called them out. Friends, cast your minds back. Maybe it's a long time ago. Before you were saved. Friends, you know what sin was back then. You knew... That whenever the impurity of sin came into your life, it was easy to dispel, wasn't it? I thought about uh, Lady Macbeth, whenever she showed uh, Macbeth Duncan's blood on her hands. She says, yet a little water clears us of this deed. All the evidence is gone with the washing of our hands. And that's the way we thought, was not it? Before we were saved, we probably never even thought of it as sin. And then... Whenever our sins started to catch up with us, there was chaos ensuing in our lives. You know, the lies that we were telling, the, the things that we were trying to do, the deceptions that we were keeping, and there was chaos. And it started to build and build in our lives. And every time we took one step forward, it seemed that we took five steps back. 
And friends, to see this, all we have to do is look at the world in which we live. And we don't look in judgment on other folk because we were there once. But all we have to do is look at the popular descriptions of life that live, uh, that are out there. Sin causes complications beyond complications in people's lives. People, and yet people don't see that sin is a problem. When they say one thing and do another, they don't seem to recognize that those contradictions have ramifications. When they deny the reality of the world in which it lives, and then wonder, why has it all gone so wrong? Friends, we know why it's gone wrong. It's because of sin. It's because of the choices that have been made. And yet, in the chaos of life, people hardly think about it. You talk to them about righteousness and think you're talking about something alien. Think you're talking about something that doesn't matter. That's something that's pointless. Something that's hopeless. When you tell them that's the reason why they've gotten themselves into trouble, they think you're mad. Friends, see for us Christians to embrace sin, it's to delve into that chaos that we left behind years ago. It's to delve into that despair that was once part of our lives and that we rejoiced in being released from it. You remember when you were saved and the joy that it brought to your heart? The relief, the burden that was lifted like, like pilgrim at the cross. The burden that, that you weren't going to have to bear the weight of these sins anymore. That you weren't going to have to tell these lies anymore. That you weren't going to have to keep up this facade anymore. That you weren't having to, to do this. And do that. that you've been released, that you've been set free, that you've been cleansed. And that your past was no longer being held against you by God. Friends, why would we sin and go back? that. Why would we sin and go back to that? Friends, if there's a hurricane blowing around your house, you stepped out in that hurricane, you were near blew away, and suddenly managed to get yourself back in, what would be the sensible thing to do? Stay where you are. Don't go back out. But friends, we as Christians, we make the mistake. We go back out. But don't go back out. Put your faith in Christ. Put your faith in holiness and in all that Christ has promised you. Because sin is only taking you back to where you've already been before. And it was nothing good. You were rescued from it. Friends, thirdly, why would you sin? You know what you're getting. You know what you're getting with sin. It says in verse 21 to 23, But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, what a sin promises. Prince, sin promises a thrill. Sin promises a sense of freedom. Sin promises control over our destiny. Sin promises perhaps even a round of applause from those who see it. Friends, what do we really get from sin? Think back. Think back this week to the sins that we've committed. The thrill is never as good as we thought it would be. Never as good as it was promised. Never as good as it was the first time. The thrill is a diminishing, has a diminishing sense of return. We commit the sin and all we have is emptiness. What do we really get from sin? We get a prison of our own making. We get ensconced in the lies and the chaos of our lives. What does sin get us? The people who maybe at the beginning applauded us will now look at us puzzled and not let us in their house because of the, the, the journey that we've taken down into wickedness. What does sin get us? Scripture tells us sin gets us physical and eternal death. Friends, sin hasn't changed since this was written 2,000 years ago. 
It hasn't changed in all the lifetime of humanity. The same promises, same lies. Same ends, same destination. Nothing whatsoever has changed. Whenever you and I sin, we are embracing the same old rubbish again. And we know what it is. We know what it is. But what does Paul tell us? Paul tells us that there's another way. Paul tells us to choose holiness. Paul tells us to choose righteousness. Paul tells us to to choose the journey of sanctification. To, to, To trust that Christ knows what he's doing, that the Holy Spirit is speaking the truth to our hearts, that the Word of God is reliable, that when we commit ourselves to trusting him, when we choose righteousness over sin, we are on the path that leads to heaven and home. We're on the path that we want to be on from our hearts. We're on the path that's different, set apart from anything that we've done before. We're on the path that goes to the place where we can know God. Friends, who will you serve? Who are you serving? Who am I serving? This question is about more than whether we sin or not. This is about more than what we do or don't do. Go and don't go. Think and don't think. This is about control. Who has control of your life? Friends, If you're a Christian and you're giving in to sin and just without a fight, then first of all, there's little evidence that you're saved in the first place. Isn't that scary? But second of all, you're giving over control of your life to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Basically. To all that God hates. That's not where we want to be. And we thank the Lord Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness even for the Christian who falls into sin. He says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, friends, if you're in that position, I don't know if you are or not. I hope you're not. But turn to Christ, seek forgiveness, and he will set you on the right path again. But Christian today, don't give in in the, in the fight against sin. Don't think it doesn't matter. It does. It does matter. Who you serve really matters. And the thing is, when you choose holiness, you're choosing what you really love. When you choose holiness, you're delving into knowing God. What's better than knowing God? The infinite one. The one that we cannot fathom in our own minds, and yet God invites us into a relationship with him to know him, understand him for for all of eternity. This is what life is really about. To understand and to know him as our friend and our Lord. Friend, to choose holiness is to, is, is, is to cash in the guarantee of all God's promises. You know, sins, lies, but God tells the truth. And whenever he has promised, we will have what he has promised. We will know what he has promised. We will experience what he has promised. Friends, this is the joy of this passage. It's a defense against sin. It's a, it's a, it's a bulwark, a, a shield, a fence against feeling. But it's an invitation. It's a, it's, a, it's a push. It's a drive. It's a drawing on into relationship with God. And it's easy. It's simple. It's to love what he loves. To rejoice in what he rejoices in. And to long for what he longs for. Friends, that verse at the end is is terrifying, isn't it? For the wages of sin is death, because we know we're sinners. But friends, let's rejoice today. We're going to be singing, Oh, happy day that fix my choice in a minute. Why do we sing it? Because the free gift of God is eternal life. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just... Again, just thank you so much. So much that you know us so well. That you haven't left us on our own. We thank you that you've saved us for time and for eternity.
We thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit to direct us in the path that we should go. You've given us your word, Lord, to teach us the right path. And you've changed our hearts through Jesus Christ to make us love what you love. Father, we just pray that, the, that we will know the reality of all these things in our lives today. Lord, that you will defend us against the temptations that come against us to destroy our lives. The lies that, that creep into our hearts and minds that we want to believe. And yet we know they'll lead us nowhere apart from into the gutter. Lord, thank you for the gospel that showed us the wonder of who you are. Thank you for that happy day when we put our faith in you. And Lord, as we sing about that happy day, Lord, may it be our song no matter what temptation comes against us. Amen.